Anyway, thank you so much for this invitation and for the very friendly introduction. Also, by training, I'm a historian and sociologist. I'm, as Stefan has just introduced me, I'm a scholar of memory. It means that I'm more interested, that I am more interested in how and why the past is mobilized for present purposes than in the processes of the past themselves. I'm not a scholar of industry, but I crossed this field at least twice. First, while leading an oral history project on how workers of those Polish factories that were privatized and sold to multinationals remember the transformation from socialism to capitalism. And second, as part of my general interest in how post socialist countries have reframed their cultural heritage in the three decades following the fall of the Berlin Wall. To meet the slightly contradictory pressure from the organizers of the conference, Stefan asked me to speak on Eastern Europe rather than just Poland, where the majority of my fieldwork has been done, and he then asked us to be concise and back our keynote in 20 25 minutes to allow enough time for discussion. I will attempt to generalize broadly some of the findings of my research relating to both vernacular and cultural memories of the transformation. And I hope not to speak more than 30 minutes. I would like to discuss some key issues pertaining to alternative spaces, temporalities, and agencies that often evade conventional historiography and memory politics of Eastern European transformation and deindustrialization processes. And particularly, I will try to relate the mnemonic entanglement with the global north and the global south implied by the title of our conference. However, let me start with explaining my understanding of a few basic concepts that informed my talk, as I am now aware that all of those terms, deindustrialization, transformation, memory, are contested and become even more so when discussed in the context of Eastern Europe. I prefer the term industrial transformation rather than in, uh, the industrialization to echo what Stefan has just said, because as you all know, deindustrialization has been a process of uneven temporal and geographical development unfolding differently in various places. Since at least the 1990s, it has been popular in social sciences to recognize deindustrialization as a gradual fall in the importance of manufacturing in terms of jobs and other devices. However, this interpretation framed by the perspective of some of the countries of the global north, where it's also contested, <laughs> frequently overlooks the experience of rapid shock therapy in post-socialist countries, which meant on the one hand, the sudden collapse of some branches of industry, and on the other hand, the transformation of others within the changing framework of global connectivity as brilliantly demonstrated in the book by Old Philip and other members of the Shipyard Collective. In effect, rather than speak of Eastern uh, European uh, deindustrialization after 1989, it's more prudent to talk of its industrial transformations, which include deindustrialization and other processes, like, for example, the most recent industrial revolution for Europe. Aware of a variety of approaches to transformation, I propose viewing transformation from the memory perspective and speaking about it in terms of liminal social change. In the light of current debate in cultural anthropology, I understand liminality broadly, that is, as a situation in which ruptures and reinvention become the norm of modernity. In this broad sense, the idea of liminality refers to the loss of taken for granted structures and the situations that allows for new institutions, norms, and values to emerge. Social communities shift, traditions are challenged, and the future becomes uncertain. The memories of those transformations are historical narratives and representations uh, that make sense of those changes. Yeah, and that's a product placement. <laughs> with Veronica Peha, we have recently co-edited a book, and Veronica is with us, <laughs> titled Remembering the Neoliberal Pan economic change and collective memory in Eastern Europe after 1989. The authors who contributed to the book provide insights into the role of economic memories of the transformation by highlighting the several levels. First, there are the economic foundational myths, which are widely held beliefs about the ideological project of economic transformation, most frequently articulated by political elites, who use them not only to provide a clear narrative, 
and what occurred in the late 1980s and 1990s, but also to legitimize themselves and delegitimize uh, their opponents. Second, the vernacular memory is associated with social abuse of the emerging social stratification, new patterns of recognition and labor market experience. Finally, the book discusses cultural memory of transformation implicated in economic change, with which forms a layer of representation depicted in films, books, or museums. Cultural memory is related to political and vernacular memories in various ways, but it is the most durable one. It continues to actualize myths and reinterpret cultural imaginaries of the transformation for next generation. These three layers of memory offer a complex picture of constructed past evolving in different temporalities and social spatial, uh, and, and social and spatial dimensions. In the latter part of my talk, I show several examples beyond the boundaries of the book of vernacular and cultural memories activated throughout the industrial transformation. Hmm. Maybe try pointing at um, something else. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, so that's something else. But before I go any further, let me address the elephant in the room as the title of the conference comparing development of the global south and the global north from the 1970s to the present day or mid Eastern Europe, the main research focus of our colleagues from RESET, as well as the two organizers of the conference work. And I could not resist sharing with you this picture of quite literal <laughs> as opposed to metaphorical from the City Museum of Rijeka, which, as I will show later, provides quite a good illustration of problematizing the global south and the global north in Eastern European context. In a well-known article in search of the global east, Martin Miller wrote, in thinking of the world as divided into a global north and the global south, the east has ended up in some sort of the netherlands. Its interstitial position, not quite rich, but neither quite poor, not just colony, but neither just colonizer, has made it difficult to categorize. Should we perhaps use the term of global east, as proposed by Miller and other scholars, most recently Korean global historian Ji-Hyun Lim. Ji-Hyun Lim uses the concept of global East to challenge the concept of the West, ultimately arguing that the categories of the East and the West are blurred and should be deconstructed along the concept of the global East and the South. Given the growing differences in economic and social indices across Eastern Europe, I hope speakers in the following sessions will provide us with data to address the question of where we belong. My task is made easier because memory scholars like to talk about regions in terms of discursive construction. Following Mary Wolf, Maria Todorova, and many others, we are trained to investigate the processes of invented or imagined regions such as Eastern Europe made up by both outsiders and locals. In the recent collection we co-edited with Simon Lewis, Jeff Olick, and Gosha Parker, we propose a category of transnational memory regions that are beyond national borders but not totally universal. The contributors to this volume demonstrate that regions of memory are constituted not only by their geographical proximity, but by their participation in the discussions, uh, discourses about topics and perspectives that bring them together. In a similar way, we can think of industrial memory regions or industrial landscape, if you will, as shown in ever growing research on those topics. Well, after, you know, uh, by the end of that talk. <laughs> the regions of memory in industrial context are the scars of creation, but they also might become very real constellations of material heritage. In his major comparative research on the memory cultures of the industrialization, Stefan Berger posits a macro level typology of industrial heritage regime divided across the neoliberal Anglo world, continental Western Europe, the global south, and the post communist country. Researchers also speak of the regions of memory at the micro level, as for instance, demonstrated by the contributors to the volume Industrial Heritage and Regional Identities, of some of them are with us uh, in the room, which focuses on South Wales and New South Wales, Asturias, North Padicale, Northern Kyushu, Greater Pittsburgh, as well as Romania's Q Valley and Warsaw Industrial Area in Northern Hungary. What I want to do now is to illustrate some particular aspects of industrial nemoscapes at the natural and cultural levels that relate to fuzzy boundaries between global north and global south in the global east. If regions are discussed as contracts, contracts, constructs, 
and we are in Vienna. At this point, I must share with you a quote from a biographical interview we recorded in the small town of Świecie, northern Poland, where with a group of colleagues, uh, we studied the transformation of local paper, of local paper mill, which was sold to Austrian Monty in the 1990s. We had to repeat me that in Eastern Europe, teaching is needed. You need training. I remember a colleague who could not put up with it anymore at some point, took a ruler and a map, and showed them that Warsaw and Vienna are almost equal. A quote comes from uh, uh, an engine in Magda, who was the close observer of the privatization and reorganization processes in the 1990s. She recalled with bitterness negotiation with an Austrian company about production infrastructure. Apparently, this quote refers to the constructive nature of the geographical region which in the 1990s could be depicted by the metaphors of the global north and global south, with Vienna being in the north and Schwierche in the south. It points to the frustration of the local staff, who in this and many other cases lamented the shrinking agency, the feeling of loss of the factories that was no longer theirs, the fact that it was sold to the foreign owner undermined the national pride because they had to adjust to foreign superiors and different organization cultures. Uh, this made them feel inferior, felt patronized, and at times insulted. However, indirectly, as I will try to show, this quote also hints at such countries with foreign cultures like Polish engineers and qualified industrial staff that moved them a bit from the global south towards the global north. It has been one of the significant findings of our oral history project with over 130 industrial workers belonging to the generation of Polish baby boomers who were in their mid-careers when the socialists collapsed, the social frameworks of, uh, of there are not only national and local, but also relate to the transnational memory of the industrial branches. This memory perspective has been particularly specific to those who had some agency in factories before or after the collapse of socialism, like trade unions, party nomenclatura members, managers, but also qualified technical staff. What also might be interesting for those of you who are historians now engaged in developing the concept of long transformation mentioned by uh, Philip, is that memories of our interviewees very much embody this concept because they point to the 1970s rather than to 1989 as an important moment opening the life of it to global entanglements. The 1970s was the time when Polish industry adopted new modes of production and explored markets in the global south. At the time, the Polish state relied on Western loans to boost industrial development. The state kept by, um, buying Western licenses for industrial production that improved the accessibility of consumer goods such as cars and facilitated technological modernization. The, pro the process promoted the towns in Europe and Poland's increased engagement in the global economy, as Alexandra Komodnicka showed recently in her dissertation defended at the UN. In effect, young Polish engineers and qualified, qualified workers employed in those factories became privileged over thousands of others working in other places at the time in Poland by starting to participate in the international circulation of goods and of technical knowledge. They learned new skills and acquired foreign languages while being trained by workers from many Western companies that sold to foreign and often outdated technologies. By goods produced in Polish factories as a result of those technology transfers were not competitive in Western markets. They were attracted for both the domestic Polish market and developing economies of the global south. Therefore, Polish engineers and other qualified staff negotiated contracts and trained subcontractors in countries throughout Europe, Asia, Africa, and Latin America. In our interviews, this focus enthusiasm and fascination about the 1970s as a period of great personal adventure. They shared numerous stories about observing strikes in Italy, negotiating of contracts in the UK, learning how to operate a new machine, Sweden sending cars to Mexico, opening production line in Libya, or getting stuck for some reason in China. When the factories were sold to multinationals in the 1990s, the qualified staff was not the one who suffered the most downsizing as they possessed necessary skills to survive on the job. If they were let off, they were able to secure alternative sources of income 
by changing the employer, starting their own business, or anything. If they kept their jobs in the factories, they were enrolled, enrolled in training programs and were given opportunities to improve their jobs. Those stories give another dimension of transnational memories of industrial branches. For instance, they acknowledge the lobbying for foreign investment as a chance to connect with global economy, which had they already known quite well. This acknowledgement comes especially from those who advance to managerial position or executive board, <coughs> or even took part in negotiation about privatization of their factories. Some of them made outstanding for these factories. On the other hand, as I have already mentioned, discussing the case of Magda, some specialists and workers lamented this thinking agency as they could not impact the course of the bank's enemies. But those complaints also often mobilized transnational frameworks of them. By blaming foreign owners for bad management or Polish politicians and colleagues from the same factory for selling off common goods to foreign hands. Nonetheless, the educated social groups kept their jobs and often upgraded their material status even if frustrated and dissatisfied with foreign organizational cultures. On the whole, the stories of engineers and technical staff who work in the private factory illuminated the 1970s matter for each generation because they encounter with the global economy can be traced back to them. This certainly stands in stark, in stark contrast with biographies of those shop floor workers that were led off in the 90s and whose entire world dissolved over less than one decade. But nonetheless, offers a perspective of transregional region of industrial memories are summarized by one of our interviewees who said, and now we belong to the global family of ArcelorMittal steelworkers. The zooming into vernacular memories of Polish industrial employees might also help it uh, might also show that the metaphors of the global north and global south might relate to diverse experiences of social groups with the elite heading into the direction of the global north, leaving the others behind. That, of course, reminds of the concept, concept again of semi peripheries with, with the world system theory, and again helps to raise the question whether the global east should not be seriously considered as a category of further empirical research. Please. Do you have any no, suggestions? No, because now I really need it. Maybe the battery. Maybe the battery will be taken off. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
supported by the municipalities, the state, and the EU funding. The situation is dynamic and going in diverse directions, such as on the one hand, denotarization of Cobbus North open cast mine by turning it into artificial lake in East Germany, or the investment in the lower Dikovic area in Ostrava in the Czech Republic, where a revitalized former steelworks and coal mining complex are a major source of production. Poland is particularly densely populated with industrial zone. Katowice in Silesia is a major hub for the memories of mining, with the Museum of Silesia that attempt to mediate German and Polish influences in the region. The ECX in Gdańsk commemorates the history of the shipyard famous of the Solidarity Strikes in 1980. Nova Huta in Krakow is the main site of commemoration of socialist time, uh, time steel works and steel works and which of the textiles. All those sites are instances of mobilizing imagined industrial communities for present purposes. What I find important is they often relate the narratives and aesthetics to transnational representation of given industry branch, such as mining, textiles, or steelworks. As uh, Christian Dicker argues, quote, despite the unevenness of industrializing and deindustrializing processes, one cannot overlook the commonalities and transnational influences in the economic and cultural performance of coal and steel producing regions. Think of the machinery, terminology, work processes, environmental uh, transfor uh, transformation, labor migration, time, sound, and smell. Industrial culture has connected regions around the world. And so even if heritage sites commemorate local events and processes, they also form regions of memory with other museums that they hang around the world in terms of the ways they tell their stories and in terms of their aesthetics. Sometimes they also refer to each other. I haven't heard so many references to Polish Wieliczka, a salt mine close to Krakow turned into a heritage site, as in Khadra salt mine close to Islamabad, where they speak of Wieliczka as a sister salt mine. As industrial museums situate their stories in local, national, and transnational settings, it is interesting that many of those sites represent not only the socialist past and the industrialization of Eastern Europe is commonly associated with this period, but they mobilize the industrial memories prior to that past, those of the 19th century and the interwar period, in this way becoming important agents of reconfiguring our imagined geographies of Eastern Europe that were framed by the Cold War and post-1989 transformation. Importantly, in this way, those museums add yet another dimension to current discussion, to current ways of discussion and decolonization museums as a way of illustration. And uh, uh, let me briefly discuss examples of two kinds of science. The city museum of Rieka, which I already mentioned, is placed in the so-called sugar palace that one wants to represent, that once was the representative space of the GST Rieka company, a major importer of sugar to Europe. The museum was refurbished last decade when Rieka wanted to put the European capital of culture in 2020. Its curators took seriously the transnational tone in this geography. The museum tells the story of Rieka as a port city that connected different cultures and parts of the world. A significant part of the exhibition is devoted to, quote, three centuries of industry and the story uh, of Rieka narrated as one, quote from the guide, began with sugar, continued with the production of paper, and cl concluded with foundries, the torpedoes factory, shipyards, and the production of engines, uh, engine structures and lorries, and of course. The upper part of the museum is quite a detailed story of sugar production in Rika, however, only with some square information about the world and condition. Moreover, while the entire exposition, exposition includes lots of information and nuances about the social history of Rika, including its various social and ethnic groups, political and class struggles, it does not problematize the colonial relations. People working on the plantations are shown by a few images more as an ornament without further discussion of the status and how they work contributes to the prosperity of the owners of the factory and more generally Rieka and Europe. Therefore, an attempt to tell the transnational history of Rieka is uh, still incomplete. 
the similar example from Wuch. The other example comes from Wuch and Uchagata. We'll talk more later uh, at this conference. I will just talk very briefly. Wuch, as you know, is situated close to Warsaw, was a major textile producer at the times of the Russian Empire and in the socialist times. The cultural memory of the 19th century, which as a multi ethnic city of Jews, Poles, Germans, and Russians, is quite well known in Poland because of the cultural production about the issue. After the collapse of the textile industry in the 1990s, the cultural heritage of Wuch was for some time was for some time neglected, eventually, however, became a great inventory against the background of commercialization and gentrification of the city's memory. One of the biggest reconstruction projects was sponsored by the French developer Apsis on the site of industrial complex in the 90s, uh, in the 19th uh, and the early 20th century by the Poznanski family. The three, there are three sides to tell uh, the story of the Wuch textiles, factory museum, Wuch museum, both related to the Poznanski family, and also central museum of textiles in former Greyers factory. And they're quite conscious about the city's multi ethnic and multi religious past. And similarly, as in Beka, they tell the stories of social class and political struggles. They also tell multiple histories of workers' life in Wuch. However, at all those two sides, I found only one small piece of information where the cotton came from the history. And you really need to look for to find it. Ironically, more attention to Wuch entanglement. With the wider world is given to luxurious goods collected by the Poznansk family in the global south, then to the non European part of the story of cotton that made both the fashion and the history of wood. To conclude, I've concentrated on a few examples from two very different memoir caves, the Nakira and Kaltra, that in my opinion relate to the conference topic by demonstrating how the post-industrial memory regions of the global east complicate the global north and global south event. These examples also help to see overlapping industrial transformation with different temporalities and driving forces rather than a transformation at a singular breakthrough in Eastern European history. Looking at those developments of the last three decades, we can make informed guesses about the future of, uh, of industrial uh, Future of memory of industrial transformation in the region. First, the role of the national memories as those of Magda and her colleagues, and intangible heritage of socialist and post 1989 transformation will inevitably find themselves in decline because of biological reasons, while cultural memory and material heritage will grow important. Second, the shape of post industrial heritage will be determined by available resources. If public funds are not available, Industrial sites will be abandoned, leaving some room for commercialization or grassroots activism, as I briefly illustrated it with the case of Hidden Zanini. If on site projects are impossible, the digital space will become more important. Currently, it is in the case of Donbass in Ukraine, which has become a place for multiple complicated memory projects of pro Ukrainian and pro Russian interconnection in the internet space. So, the chronological and geographical horizon of some of the industrial projects will expand, informed by globalized cultures, as is already the case with textile mining and steelworks heritage sites. To open question that remains is to what extent the current ways of decolonization will change museums towards a more critical approach on how the global East has profited from the global South in the course of its industrial transformation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rana, for um, reminding us uh, in terms of uh, chronology, but also in terms of geography, uh, that uh, sometimes uh, we have the chronologies and the geographies uh, quite at odds with each other uh, when we think, think about 1989, 1990, as Mr. Zora was in fact, it often already sounded earlier, but also in terms of the uh, East as the elephant in the group. Um, when we talk about uh, North South comparison. So, I think we'll take a second um, keynote immediately and then have a discussion of both uh, keynotes at the end. So, uh, 
Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Finland uh, here to Hall of Vienna. He is professor of history at uh, Cape Breton University in Nova Scotia in Canada uh, and a core member of the NEPO project that I already um, um, talked about. Uh, in fact, he will be hosting the big NEPO conference uh, there in three weeks' time. Uh, it's a very important and distinguished oral historian of deindustrialization. Who has written a marvelous monograph titled Closing Cisco, Industrial Design in Atlantic Canada's Geo Cities. And uh, in the context of global comparison, I might add also the co author of a wonderful article comparing the industrialization in North America and South America in the Handbook of Latin American Studies, which was co authored with Stephen Hyde. Lachlan, over to you. Thanks so much, Simon, and thanks, Joanna, <clears throat> for such a great, uh, great first paper. Uh, so, firstly, I'd like to express my gratitude to all of you, uh, the organizers, as well as all of the participants here at the Deindustrialization and Reindustrialization Reconnected Conference. I'm really grateful for your, your kind invitation. It was beautiful today to walk around Vienna a little bit, not an opportunity I get all the time, so that was fantastic, uh, as well as to be able to come and share my thoughts <clears throat> on critical issues within deindustrialization studies. As I looked at the conference program, uh, <clears throat> it's evident that this event here, uh, this over the next few days, will serve as a vital platform for considering the role of political economy, class, transnationalism, uh, as well as economic redevelopment in our studies of extractive industries and other sectors. Crucially, I think that this conference uh, aims to bridge the experiences of the global North and South, fostering meaningful conversations across the period of industrial crisis. Um, and I'm genuinely, again, want to be part of this event and eagerly anticipate the next coming days. Now, uh, as we delve into scholarly treatments of the industrialization, does this work? Yeah. Oh, that was, yeah. All right, as we get into the scholarly treatments of industrialization, we find that they primarily focused on local and national aspects of economic and political change within the region historically called the industrialized world, or parts of the global north. Now there's already an extensive historiographical treatment of deindustrialization in places like Canada, the United States, countries of Western Europe, and even Australia. Occasionally, comparative studies have delved into deindustrialization on the borderlands of these spaces, suggesting, I think, a growing recognition of the transregional and transnational aspects um, of deindustrialization as a phenomenon of structural change. <clears throat> these approaches shed light on the influential role of the state and community actors in shaping processes that were traditionally attributed solely to broad macroeconomic changes. For example, Tracy Newman's book, Remaking the Rust Belt, gives a comparative analysis of Hamilton, Ontario, and Canada, and Pittsburgh in the United States, highlighting different responses across the border in these North American cities. Similarly, the recent collection, uh, Deindustrialization of 20th Century Europe, you see there on the screen, edited by Stefan Berger, Stefan Russo, and Christian Wick, provides a trans-regional <clears throat> and comparative framework to understand deindustrialization in Germany and Italy. While striving for disciplinary specificity, it's imperative to establish kind of a precise definition of what we're talking about when we discuss the industrialization in the field. Of course, we've long since moved beyond the kind of purely economistic terms presented by Barry Bluestone and Bennett Harrison in their uh, widely cited work, right, the deindustrialization of America. And it's worth noting that much early research grappled with the perceived end of the 19th the post-1945 period in North American historiography, which is often tinted with layers of nostalgia that paints this as an idyllic golden age characterized by unionized prosperity and the ascent of the blue collar middle class. Of course, we now recognize that this historical construction is not all encompassing as of course, gender and race have been instrumental lenses in highlighting lived experiences that have diverged from this narrative. And additionally, we must be aware that these changes in the Americas occurred within a settler colonial context. Um, 
uh, rooted in the historical theft of indigenous lands um, and the displacement and dispossession of indigenous nations all across the continent. Fred Burrell, another member of Depot, wrote an article called the Settler Order Framework, which serves as a time, timely reminder for North American historians of labor and the working class to remain mindful of this, this settler context within which we work. Um, nevertheless, and despite the limitations of that framing, I think that these decades in the global north did carry profound material and cultural significance for millions of working class families. Terms like Trump Glorieuse by the French, the long boom by the British, and referred to as the great exception by historian Jefferson Cowie in the broader history of capitalism, these decades held a distinct place. And of course, our understanding of their exceptional nature only becomes apparent when contrasted with what ensued. The economic ruptures of the 70s, 80s, and 90s resulted in the dispossession and immiseration of industrial workers throughout North America and Western Europe, leaving a lasting impact, as we all know. Historians like Jim Tomlinson, Marion Fontaine, and Xavier Vigna rightly emphasize the central role of deindustrialization in shaping the history of the latter half of the 20th century and the first two decades of the 21st. Deindustrialization then is an inherent component of industrial capitalism in the advanced market economies. While the prevailing view of the post-war era as a period of prosperity followed by crisis is accurate in general, I think it tends to overlook the geographical disparities and the truncated nature of post-war prosperity in certain regions. And by broadening our perspective and considering the experience of both Global North and South, we can gain fresh insights into the intricate dynamics of industrialization. Seth Schindler and, and several of this person's colleagues aptly highlight this issue, noting in a 2020 article for Area Development, much of the existing scholarship on deindustrialization implicitly assumes that the South's deindustrialization, sorry, assumes that the South's industrialization has come at the expense of cities and communities in the North Atlantic. This assumption couldn't be further from the truth. There is a disconnect between where deindustrialization is studied and where it is taking place. And that's the end of that quote. I think that's, that's crucial. And indeed, it's important to explore how different regions have confronted these challenges and examine the factors uh, that shaped these different trajectories. Embracing transnational and comparative approaches and reevaluating the binary perception of deindustrialization in the global north and industrialization in the global south will undoubtedly enhance our understanding of these processes and also our public engagement in this, in this particular area at this point is necessary, I think, because it complicates the sort of easy answers and, and, and nostrums that are peddled by the far right, chief among them old canards about stolen jobs, immigrant labor, and the rest of it. And I think we're well positioned to have that conversation. Now, overall, these recognitions are, of course, gaining, gaining uh, traction within the field. The August 2022 meeting of Depot, which Stefan mentioned, revolved around the central theme of transnationalizing the industrialization studies. And recent collaborative publications in North America and Europe have also underscored these efforts, including a special issue of the Canadian Labour Journal, Labour for Travail. Um, a cursory glance at this conference program further highlights the groundbreaking work uh, that's already underway with a clear global focus evident in almost every session. Uh, it's really great to see. So clearly the momentum has shifted. People are doing this. Um, in contributing to this collective effort, my focus today will be on examining some of the early influences of deindustrialization historiography in Canada which will involve some discussion on the center periphery framework popularized by intellectual and political economists in the 20th century, but also two social movements that emerged in the Atlantic region of Canada, which drew upon ideas of regional underdevelopment as an explanation for uneven economic growth uh, and ultimately deindustrialization. And corresponding with this discussion, I'm going to talk about how this intersects with with the framework and conceptions of deindustrialization in Latin America. 
So this presentation, as Stefan already mentioned, will draw upon some recent research that I've done in this area in terms of Canadian political economy, uh, as well as some work that I've done in the past in collaboration with Stephen High uh, in, in Montreal. Now, the historiography of deindustrialization in Canada challenges the deep periodization of industrial crisis that we often think of. Given Canada's status as the second largest country in the world, the dynamics of capital mobility, accumulation, and dispersal unfolded at varying rates across different regions of the country. British Columbia on the West Coast uh, saw a significant industrial decline of boiler and engine industries in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Historian John Lutz describes how transportation linkages across the continent, such as the Canadian Pacific Railway, uh, combined with discriminatory rail rates and the shift toward non-local ownership resulted in the United States and Britain taking over much of that market share and industry relocating. On the other side of the country, uh, the maritime provinces highlighted here on the map, witnessed deindustrialization and contraction of manufacturing, coal and steel during the 1920s and 30s. This transformation was influenced again by the expansion of transport networks and the implementation of Canadian trade policy that encouraged centralization of industrial production along the St. Lawrence River towards cities like, like Toronto and Montreal. Now, one notable aspect in the Canadian context that's moved through the 20th century is the active role that was played by the state in combating deindustrialization. During the 1950s and 60s, the provincial government in Nova Scotia, one of the provinces in the Maritimes there in the circle, um, implemented a variety of industrial planning responses, including subsidies and even nationalized uh, the coal and steel industries in response to the threat of closure. This interventionist approach often is often associated with a regionalist impulse. Um, indeed, it wasn't solely driven by kind of ideological motivations. In fact, it comes from a conservative government. Um, but it exhibits kind of this notion that the Maritimes as a region is, is underdeveloped or underserved due to kind of national economic dynamics. Uh, and indeed, this is rooted in a broad recognition that the Canadian economy operates this way. <laughs> which we'll talk about in a moment. Historian Don Davis explored this relationship as an offshoot of the metropolis hinter hinterland dichotomy popularized in international dependency theory. The concept of underdevelopment in certain regions like the Maritime provinces in, in uh, comparison to places like Montreal and Toronto informed those state responses. Uh, this notion drew inspiration from early Canadian political economist, Harold Innes, who we'll talk about in a moment, as well as two kind of social movements that emerged at the same time. One called the Maritime Rights Movement, which came about uh, under the banner of kind of regional elites, and the other, the emergence of kind of class conscious regionalism that was expressed uh, by Nova Scotia's coal miners during the labor wars of the 1920s. Let's see if this works. I need to Okay, so for his part, Harold Innes's contributions to Canadian political economy laid the foundation for understanding this center periphery relationship. Two of his works, The Fur Trade in Canada, 1930, and The Cod Fishery, 1940, introduced the concept of what he called the staples thesis. And according to Innes, Canadian political economy revolved around the extraction and exportation of primary resources like the fur trade in North America or the Atlantic cod fishery. He argued that the center was associated with secondary manufacturing and economic diversification, while the periphery relied on the production and export of the single staple commodity or a small set of related products. Innes examined this process at both the international level, describing the colonial era when European metropoles like London and Paris acted as the center to the Canadian periphery as well as at the national level, um, uh, where, uh, yeah, where industrialization and the consolidation of political and economic power shifted the center to Canadian metropolises like Toronto and Montreal. Consequently, the peripheral regions remained dependent on staples products like timber, cod, and coal, while central Canada experienced great growth in secondary manufacturing. As Stephen High argues in his new article, The Radical Origins of the Deindustrialization Thesis, 
they were adopted and expanded. These ideas were adopted and expanded by key figures in the Canadian New Left during the 1970s, who combined the broad awareness of Latin American dependency theory with what he calls Innes's homegrown theory of Canadian underdevelopment. And of course, intellectual theorizations were not the only influences that preceded the mid-century Canadian fascination with regional underdevelopment and deindustrialization. We turn our attention briefly to the maritime rights movement of the 1920s, which was a political movement calling for greater political representation for the region uh, with reforms to trade and transport policies to offset what they viewed as structural disadvantages caused by confederation. Despite, the, sorry, despite its broad rhetoric, this movement ultimately relied upon a relatively narrow base of political support, largely drawing upon the region's businessmen and professional classes who lobbied in Ottawa for their cause. And by way of contrast, a more class conscious form of, of regionalism did percolate also in Nova Scotia, this time within the coal fields, not centered in, in Halifax or St. John, the cities, but the more rural coal towns. Um, Indeed, this sense of regionalism coming about uh, through the language of class, class struggle uh, included the foundation of a trade union newspaper, the Maritime Labour Herald, a robust trade union tradition, and a serious effort to elect labour and communist politicians municipally and provincially, uh, as well as highly politicized understandings of regional disparity uh, and, and labour conflict. Now, although these early influences on Canadian responses to the industrialization reflect a broad regionalist understanding of uneven capitalist development, we have to be cautious of employing these internationally. After all, the new left tendency to read dependency theory into Canadian political economy could give cover for an ahistorical view of the country's participation in global capitalism and exploitation. In this sense, to analyze Canada solely through the lens of, of, of periphery, as has been done in political economy to the United States or in earlier years, European colonial governments, is to deny the broad contours of the global economic exploitation in which Canada has, all too, uh, has too often been happy to participate and which is central to many of the arguments put forward by dependency theorists from the global south. Paul Kellogg, a Canadian author, explores this discrepancy in a book called The State from the Staples Trap. And you can see the quote here, he argues, the economies at the top of the global hierarchy benefit from and aggressively work to sustain the conditions that trap poor countries into dependency on staples. Canada is one of the architects of the current world system, not one of its victims. And one need only look to Canada's economic support for exploitative mining practices throughout Latin America and various anti-democratic efforts of 2019 crew in Bolivia to see that this is indeed all too true. On the other hand, and with the full recognition that it won't be a direct theoretical uh, application, I tend to agree with Stephen High, who writes that the Canadian experience of what he describes as dependent deindustrialization rooted in these ideas of region may still hold some relevance for the examination of the topic in areas of the global south. Um, and so that's what I'm aiming to try and gesture to. So if we shift our attention to Latin America, we observe a trend of declining manufacturing shares in both employment and real value added in the last several decades. Surprisingly, contrary to the concerns expressed by um, po politicians in the American heartland during the industrial crisis of the late 20th century, industrial manufacturing in Latin America had not expanded in proportion to the decline of industrial employment in the global north. Economist Danny Roderick coined the term premature deindustrialization uh, to explain this phenomenon. And according to Roderick, the decrease in industrial employment and the relatively stagnant economic output at lower levels of per capita income compared to historically industrialized countries like Canada and the United States signified an untimely decline of those sectors. Or in simpler terms, this argument is that the common understanding of deindustrialization holds true in general that industries and jobs were located from global north to global south during the industrial crisis of the late 20th century. True to an extent, however, as globalization or neoliberal globalization and capital flows intensify, uh, this relocation occurs at an increasingly rapid pace, according to Roger. Um, and I find this overly broad, but I do believe that the Canadian example can offer some valuable insights. 
To achieve that, we need to adopt a more suitable periodization of deindustrialization in the global south, taking into account the contingent and uneven nature of these processes and paying close attention to the specific national context of industrial growth, contraction, and the emergence of corresponding social movements or, or radical workers. To gain a comprehensive understanding, um, um, we need to extend our analysis you know, beyond the neoliberal restructuring that has dominated a lot of this literature and kind of political uh, assessments of this, right? Uh, by examining the initial development of new industries, in, uh, sorry, yeah, in specific, specific national contexts and thinking about the re local, regional, national, and international dimensions of these declines, we can shed light on this topic. Um, this endeavor, of course, draws inspiration from well-established ideas like world systems theory, dependency theory, which have long been used by interdisciplinary scholars to describe the economic relationship between global north and south in terms of capital outflows and neoliberal restructuring. By incorporating these sorts of perspectives into deindustrialization studies, which again has historically focused on the experience of workers in the global north, we can enrich the discourse and broaden its scope. In Latin America, for instance, economic diversification and the emergence of new industries like textiles and auto production played a significant role in the area in, in that part of the world's growth after 1945. Scholars like David Brady, Kaya Yunus, and Gary Jareffi have argued that the ISI import substitution industrialization model, characterized by state-driven industrialization, contributed to the rise of the middle class in Latin America but also brought a heightened awareness of economic inequality and widespread poverty as the population expanded, again, resulting in social movements and resistance emerging to the ravages of kind of industrial capitalism. Of course, ISI involved a combination of protectionist measures and government intervention in the economy, um, such as the implementation of tariffs, import restrictions, state ownership schemes, and so on. Uh, and simultaneously, the population of the region more than doubled between 1945 and 1980, increasing from 155 million to 388 million uh, in that time period. This rapid population growth, coupled with massive urbanization and the shift from agriculture, posed challenges as the economic growth of the period failed to provide equity or opportunity for everyone. The decline in, uh, uh, in manufacturing employment in many new industries coincided also by the 1970s with a period of extensive state repression and violence targeting workers, leftists, and intellectuals, particularly as neoliberal reforms gained traction and expanded after the 1970s. As a result, much of the literature on deindustrialization in Latin America, and of course, this is English and French language literature that I'm looking at, so that's a limitation of this, right? Uh, we need more you know, collaborative work, uh, which I'm glad to see is already happening. Um, as much of that literature is, is framed in terms of political violence and the shift against the ISI model in favor of market-centered reforms, the birth of neoliberalism, and the exploitative arrangements and restructuring initiatives through things like the IMF and the World Bank. Now, in this context, we can see that a significant downtrend in manufacturing employment begins to impact many Latin American countries while the Canadian and American firms are also beginning to experience the major industrial crisis. Chile and Peru, for example, were among the first to experience these effects, followed shortly thereafter by other countries that shifted to trade liberalization and export promotion. In Chile, of course, this was directly related to political and economic uh, atrocities of the Pinochet regime. Um, as the dictatorship kind of radically restructured the economy after 1973, reducing industrial employ employment from 555,000 to 378,000 uh, within a decade. Manufacturing employment in Argentina similarly described, declined by 10% uh, between the same period. Now, of course, you know, this, this is not entirely new. Much great work is already being done in this space, as you just have to look at our conference to see. As in Canada and the United States, deindustrialization has emerged as a political rallying cry and a point of academic discussion and debate across Latin America. Uh, James Cipher describes a wide-ranging discussion in recent years over the nature, scope, and causes of deindustrialization in Brazil, for example. And according to Chong Soo Kim and Shung Hu Lee, 
who have compared the different paths towards deindustrialization in Latin America and Southeast Asia, quote, acknowledging that deindustrialization is a universal phenomenon that most countries experience at a certain stage of economic development can't be abstracted from the reality that the factors that cause the industrialization differ widely across countries, thereby dictating different industrialization paths. In the Canadian example, where scholars have begun tracing these earlier roots of deindustrialization in the political economy of the colonial state before unpacking these kind of internal center periphery dynamics, uh, we're able to get a sense for how the unique national and regional contexts intersect with global economic shifts to produce a unique process of deindustrialization and particular forms of workers' resistance that ultimately result in something like a conservative government nationalizing bullet steel, right? Um, so it's my hope that you know this sort of analysis may be more useful as, as voices are being brought into the discussion surrounding deindustrialization and its aftermaths for working class families across the global north and south. Uh, again, I just want to say that I'm really excited to see the papers that are scheduled over the next few days. And thank you for everything.